We'll do it that way. So uh, my name is Dave Davenport. I'm the CEO of Mother G. Uh, thank you for coming out today. Um, we have an interesting conversation that we're going to have with Frank from Memex, with maybe Rose of Sharon helping him. Uh, so Frank Jones, Rose of Sharon DeVos, uh, thanks for coming. We're going to talk about digital transfer t uh, transformation. On everyone's table, there's a sheet that looks like this. Um, who can tell me what digital transformation is? Anyone? Uh, well, uh, it is one of those terms that's used very frequently in IT worlds, technology worlds. I think it is um, a term that's overused. Uh, it's kind of like somebody in marketing, like Mike Bezo, came up with a term to apply to something that we've been doing a long time. When I started, uh, when I graduated from college and I started at ADP, uh, my father's company was a small manufacturer, and uh, they had a computer system that only did GL, and it was uh, a green screen from ADP, and the account went in and entered all the payables and receivables, and that was the, the level of computerization. He had a five-part uh, carbon form that we used uh, special typewriters, uh, I forget which the IBM Selectric version was, so that it could punch through all five copies. Uh, and then he would break those copies up and they would go to different departments. And that was how he ran his business for many years. Uh, carbon paper was the biggest innovation from uh, his grandfather to him. Um, flash forward a few years uh, and that now is a computer system, right? Now those orders are being entered into a terminal and uh, those orders now are moving through the accounting department in the customer service department and the order entry department, and they're moving through those systems electronically, right? Saved a lot of time, reduced errors, made it easier to find orders. They print out a, a you know a bill of lading and a, and a shipping, or sorry, an order for the shipping department or the production department. They would go and fill that order and and proceed it through. That was the start of digital transformation. Actually, the ADP system was the start of a digital transformation for his company. So he's long since sold that and moved on. But uh, who had email in 1990? No, no one. Because it really wasn't, there was this messaging thing within computers, but nobody really had email, right? Um, you know, voicemail, I remember my first job, that was a big um, you know, new solution that we brought in. I used to get all these little, you know, pink slips when I get to the office, right? Um, I'm old, by the way. Uh, so, so when you think about digital transformation, it's really the process of bringing technology to certain solutions in your organization that can bring value, automate for various reasons. So it might be to cut costs. It might be to improve accuracy. It might be to automate certain processes. Again, usually to improve costs, improve accuracy and quality. Um, as you think of digital transformation though, it, it transcends maybe the traditional uh, thoughts. We can take a robot or we can take a CNC machine, we can have it do a number of things today that we couldn't do 20 years ago in automating those processes. But yet we don't necessarily know what's happening in that machine while it's operating, right? We know it, you know, turn it on and then 10 parts spit out of it and we say, cool, and, but we don't know how those parts were made, if there were errors with it. Uh, we know that the machine is running or not running, but we don't know how well it's running. We don't know how the operator who's running the machine is performing relative to that process. So there's a number of variables that we don't necessarily know about that go blind in that process. And you can think about this well beyond machines. We can think about it in uh, other operations like marketing. We sent out you know, a lot of marketing materials. What happened to it? We sent out 10,000 email. Did we get any leads? What, what happened to the emails that we sent, right? So as you start thinking about 
the processes in your organization, this just is a very simple way of starting to think about digital transformation. You can start asking what, why, and who as you think about processes that might need attention, your organization as a whole. So as you're um, thinking about your organization, thinking about different areas, uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is, is Memex. And we came across Memex with Rose of Sharon, who is a past client of ours. And uh, <clears throat> it, it's really a compelling solution for those of you that have productions, especially machine-based productions. Um, I can tell you we're a human capital business. We have people who fix computer problems. Uh, help you align technology to your business and make it work so that you don't have to worry about it. Um, in that process, we very much rely today on KPIs to tell us how those folks are performing. Are they performing well? Uh, are we preventing problems? Are we aligning technology? And because of that, we track a lot of KPIs, a lot of measurements around that process to make sure that we're delivering against that value proposition. And when I think of a lot of our clients, uh, in a sense, I'll exaggerate the point, they kind of put a lot of raw materials on the front end, put some people in there, and then kind of hope that on the back end, everything comes out just fine. And then they measure what comes out on the back end and say, oh, that isn't exactly what we thought. Let's go and try and figure out how and why and what happened there. And that's inefficient, right? I mean, it's, you know, you got wasted product on the back end. It didn't come out right. You want to fix it real time. You want to get in the middle of it. And I know in our business, it's essential. And I think in manufacturing, when you have um, the investment in machinery and equipment and processes and intellectual capital to produce all those things, it's even more important, more critical to have real time reporting and in, in, in visibility into that. So. Uh, the good news for all of you is you may not have known what digital transformation was or too scared to offer your opinion, but you have, in fact, begun the journey of digital transformation by exploring some ideas today. So you, that's the good news for you. Um, I'd like to introduce Frank um, from Memex. We're going to uh, get a lot deeper into understanding how you can gain visibility into your production operation. and. Um, I think uh, the best way of putting it is before you invest another nickel in, in more assets, consider juicing more out of what you already have. And I think that's the fundamental of what we see in Memex and why we're excited to introduce them to our clients and, and to the market as best we can. Frank? Thanks to everyone, first of all, for coming. I'm sure I'll thank you a couple times. Um, one of the things we want to talk about today is everybody in this room has probably heard IIoT, uh, Internet of Things, Industry 4.0. Um, the basic premise here is the convergence of all that is what we call digital data-driven manufacturing, DDM. And that's what we're going to hear talk about. And what I want to do is try to give you a little bit of slice of where we see continuous improvement going. Um, one of my colleagues, would, if he was here today, would tell you that if you're not collecting data directly from the machine in real time, you are not practicing lean, period. That's their opinion. And of course, that ruffles some people's feathers sometimes. But I think it's I think as you see how we're going to set this up and some of the things we're going to show you, I kind of start to see the direction of why um, our, our former CTO is actually correct in that very really broad-based statement. So, what we want to talk about is I'm going to talk a little bit about some five steps to how we connect our shop, shop, our shop floor. Um, this is part of the discussion today is going to be on how we do this, and then we're going to get into the why later. Uh, also, I want to talk a little bit about how this ties into continuous improvement. And does everyone in this room know what OEE stands for? Is 
Everyone familiar with that term? Anybody? No? Uh, OE is overall equipment effectiveness. And to Dave's point, um, if you do not have necessary CNC machines on your shop floor, if you have stamping presses, press brakes, heat treat, uh, heat treat ovens, uh, EDM machines, assembly lines, manual and uh, automatic, uh, these are all assets we currently connect to. So don't think this is strictly to a machine-based discussion. If you have assets, I don't even use the word machine anymore, that you want to connect to, we have a way to do that. Okay, so how do we connect on the shop floor? So there's, there's five steps here talk about the connection. We're gonna talk about how we visualize the actual data. Uh, we're gonna produce data in real time. The whole point of why we wanna talk about this is once we get this data, we wanna see it and be able to consume it the way that we want. Uh, number three, we wanna be able to analyze the data. It's nice to have all this data, but what do we do with it once we have it? Uh, the last portion is also, what is the optimization? How do we look at the process in a couple of different ways to optimize it? We've got data, we've analyzed it, now what are we gonna to do to effect change on our shop floor? The last portion is actually our, our value proposition. Okay, so within our context, um, and what I think you're gonna find, um, if you're not, those of you who may not be familiar with this, there are several protocols in manufacturing that are getting very much uh, traction. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term MT Connect, um, that's an open source protocol. So think about 20, 25 years ago, if you have a group of machines on your shop floor from different OEMs, which is pretty typical in the shop floor today, uh, they all spoke their own languages. Nobody spoke the same language. So a group of people, including our current CEO, our past CTO, and current CTO, among other people, got together and said, well, wouldn't it be a great idea if we commonized the data so that everybody in these machines can all speak the same language in a royalty-free open source protocol that you all can consume, free. And that's what they did. So MT Connect Institute was born about uh, 11, 12 years ago. And the first alliteration was written. So now this protocol, as we sit here 12 years later, has been, has been established by a number of OEMs, like Mazax, Akumas, Makinos, Morisikis, and a number of other companies. So that is a protocol that is directly read from the machine. Why is that important? Because we're talking about real-time data, and also this data stream is extremely large. There's a number of data points we can pull from machine. Um, Fanic Controls, if you're not familiar with, is actually the largest controller manufacturer in the world. Uh, they're owned by General Electric, and what happens is uh, they have a protocol called Focus, same type of situation where now we can extract data directly from machine in a real-time manner and also a large data set. Uh, the third one on top is OPC, that's been around for a while. Now, many of you may have uh, PLC-driven pieces of equipment, like a sequence control or an Allen Bradley. This is another protocol we, that Memex can actually read natively. So what happens if you got some legacy piece of equipment that's 20 years old? Well, bottom left-hand corner, we have a hardware board, which I'll leave up here. If you guys want to see it, I'll pass it around. We make this piece of equipment. This is our IP. We assemble the board, and we install it. And that is our way to connect to everything else. So if you have a heat treat oven or if you've got a uh, uh, gear hobbing machine that's 40 years old, that's how we'll connect it. That will make, that particular board that gets passed around will make your legacy piece of equipment a web server. That's pretty much the best way to describe it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about when I do the demo. People do have input to, into our system. The operator knows things the machine is not going to tell us. So we'll show you how we capture that information. And we are a fully vertically integrated system. We can connect to your ERP, MRP, combine system for work orders and product standard transfer now so we can measure true OEE, that OEE moniker I used earlier. If you want to understand, and that's the most popular form of data collection as we speak here today, you have to be able to associate in our shop floor a worker to a work order to a machine. That's how you start the process to collect OEE and the ERP system is the start of that process. <clears throat> Within the system, um, what you're going to hear, and most of you probably heard the terms, uh, you can actually store this information on the cloud, so that we do have a cloud option for our software. Uh, but we are primarily what's called an on-premise solution, which means the server is sitting inside your four walls, and that's behind your firewall for the obvious reasons you're probably familiar with, what the cloud media. 
However, within the system that we're talking about here, you have unlimited data views. So if you connect four machines or 400 machines, it doesn't matter to us, you have unlimited data views, which means you can have large screens like we're showing here on, on our demo here today, out on the shop floor showing a group of machines, a section of plant, the entire plant, whatever it is you're looking at. Um, you can also have this on your PCs. And also, since our dashboards I'm going to show you here in a little while are actually URL pages, this could be formatted if you have the right certificates to be able to see it on your phone. So you could be outside the plant, you don't have to VPN, everyone knows what that is, you don't have to VPN the plant anymore, you'd be able to see dashboards remotely, so to speak. Okay, so this is a discussion in terms of how we analyze. There's a full reporting engine behind our software. By the way, our software's name is Tempest, T-E-M-P-U-S. That is Latin for time, because that's what we're doing, measuring time. So what we want to do is be able to slice and dice the data a variety of ways. We're not report writers at Memex, so we, we created a number of templates that you can build off of, but you can see you have the ability between a shift, a person, a machine, a work order. There's a variety of ways to slice and dice data in our system, all because we're tracking it in real time from the machine. It gives you a multitude of ways to be able to select the data. One of the things we've, we've moved in, and we talked about machine utilization, as Dave talked about before, is you have, is the machine up or down? If it's down, why is it down? That's machine utilization. Very high level, look at the data. But as time has marched on, people are now asking us, well, if you have a situation, if the machine's actually running, why is it running at 100%? It's running, but it's not 100%. How do we analyze that? So we get into feed rates and rapid overrides and things of that nature. So we're starting to analyze the slow condition running but not at 100% because we need to know when that system is not running optimally and if it's down why is it down quite frequently you see pretty well known speaker on the subject all the calculations I'm going to show you here coming up are all based on him so basically when you talk about a 1% productivity improvement that's a 2% profitability to the bottom line what does that mean so I just found that extra 20 minutes or 30 minutes we were talking about earlier that's an OE that's an OE improvement of that 1%. But if I turn around and say, well, now that I've identified that, I'm now going to stick more product on there, those numbers go up. So that's when you start to kind of matriculate through all that. And that's where you start to see paybacks in our system of even four, maybe even six months. I, I will tell you, I've never been, most of your shops, there's a couple people in this room I know, but most of your shops is, I will tell you, if you implement this and you use the data directly from the machine in real time like we're talking about, Get an, to get an IRR or even an ROI of less than 12 months is very attainable. We have numerous people who've done that. Okay? Before I go any further, is there any questions? Sorry, I know we're going to have questions later, but I, stop me if you have a question, we'll go over. Frank, I have a question. Yes. How long has this, 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 this tool actually been around and available for the manufacturer? You're talking about from, from MX? Yeah. Um, this is actually the fourth version of our software. Okay. So this goes back to. I want to say 2009-ish, it was our first original version. What I'm going to show you here, and the big difference of the current version versus what you've seen in the past, is that we sat down several years ago, and this is a four-year process, and our development team and us sat down and said, well, look, what does our customers want to see? If you buy a software, it doesn't have to be ours, any software, what you don't want it to do, the cardinal sin, is to hit a ceiling with it and not be able to use it. We maxed out, we can't use it anymore. So we built an extensible tool called Tempest, so you could plug in things. So if we're sitting here eight years from now, you guys can still be plugging in new modules and grow it. We have a full development team uh, in Memex. There's actually 30, those are sharing maybe 35 employees, I would say, in our company, uh, nine of which are development engineers. That's important. So there's always new stuff coming out that you have access to. Because we're, you're, one thing we know for sure, I don't know any of you personally, except for Dave, I have a couple other people here I do, is that either one thing, one of three things is going to change. The people are in your shop are going to change, the process is going to change, the machinery is going to change. So the question is, if you install this, how am I going to be able to roll with you? That's the big question. Because I'm going to ask you to make a pretty good investment, and if you're going to do that, I better be have an adaptable tool you can use six years from now. That's what we develop. I'm just going to add on a little bit, yep. Frank, to what you're saying there. So I think this is one of the things that sets Medics apart from it. A lot of companies are thinking, I only need to collect a certain amount of data, and they're only thinking of a limited amount of data right now. Because they can't envision in the future 
that they're going to need other information. So what happens with data is that a little bit of data creates a place for more data, right? And more data. And so having the tool that can continue to add, add, collect additional information, I think, is really one of the differentiators for mimics. Is that you're not is that you're going to be able to when you have a thirst for the next piece of information, that you'll be able to get to that piece of information. So. So next few slides are just examples. Again, what we talk about. Half the battle here is visibility of the data. And what typically happens is we install add-on boards on shop floors like what you see here. And typically, what you're gonna see is maybe a three to 6% productivity bump just because everybody's seeing the data. It's not Big Brother watching. It's just saying, hey, I'm, I'm looking at what Joe's doing across the aisle, and I wanna be on the green team, I don't wanna be on the red team. So the data being available, being able to be visualized has an impact. Almost, almost always we see a little bump from that. Okay. Another couple examples, and these are all dashboards I'm going to show you here in a little bit. But again, the consumption of the data is unlimited. So if you have five, six, eight machines, it doesn't matter. We can have add-on boards all across the shop floor. This is one of our aerospace customers on the right here. If you notice, they actually have a 15 screen TV for every machine tool in their shop floor. That's personally a little overkill for me, but that's what they want to see. The point is you can consume the data as much as you want. Okay. Um, this obviously our information that we feed in also can, can roll into demo boards, and we'll talk a little bit about Kaizen events here in a little bit, but I just want to give you an idea that this data, again, real time, would replace your manual charts, manual data collection, because now it's all in real time. So when you have your stand-up meetings on a shift basis, you'd be able to talk about what happened last shift or yesterday in real time. Okay? It's more of the same? Okay. Okay, so machine connectivity, I don't know where the board is, I circulated around. Um, without getting a lot of deep, a lot of depth with this, I think the important thing to understand is that we don't want to leave any asset behind. There's a number of times, as I said earlier, where we talk to people and say, I want to be able to connect to this, can you connect to some object that still runs high production? We want to be able to do that. That's really the key here, is to making, as I said before, a legacy piece of equipment into a web server. And that's what we need to be able to collect data. We may only get six or seven data points from an older piece of equipment. Maybe a new machine tool, a new press might give us 20, but this is still running important production. We have to be able to connect to it. So that we've always had this, this in our arsenal. Um, I think the general view in our company is that eventually, maybe all in our lifetimes, we'll see that uh, the direct software connections will overtake the legacy equipment. Uh, but right now, the average shop floor is probably 60% legacy, 40% new. So we have a ways to go. There's still a lot of old equipment that still needs to be connected, that's still running high volume production. So there's a couple of pictures here. Just want, I, we'll skim through these relatively quickly. I just want to show you how they're connected on the back end. I know it's a little more techie side, but just give you an idea on the back end of your machines how we can connect in uh, some different links. So you can just scroll through these if you want, like this though. And if you go back, maybe one real quick. This is actually a prime example. This this particular OKK machine is at the time this picture was taken was about 28 years old. So you see, you still have the ability, as I said to include this in the data collection, what we're doing with brand new machines. So it's a big advantage for us. And I will tell you the board, wherever it's floating around here, uh, we have two competitors who don't have the ability to connect to legacy equipment, so they buy our board all the time. It's an open source protocol, we'll sell it to anybody who wants it, and they'll use it to consume their data the way they want. Okay? So ERP integration. Um, whether you have an MRP system, a Kanban, or an ERP MRP system, uh, we have the ability to connect to that through two pathways. Um, the older way to do that is what's called a flat file transfer. So you would actually set up kind of a triangulation and say, here's a group of files that are <coughs> jobs are going to run, say we're going to push them down to a file share. That will trigger us to see, execute everything on the shop floor, push it back up. That's kind of the old way to do it. It still works, but it's the old way to do it. The new way is with Tempest, we built, I think we have like 500 API calls. Uh, and that's more of a direct way to connect work orders into our system. The difference between the two is basically this. If you have a file share and you guys release work orders at 8 o'clock in the morning, so just say 10 of them, okay? And we run those 10. Unless you update that file, we don't see anything else the rest of the day until you update something. API call is a little different. Is you run those same 10 jobs out to us, but then all you say, hey, we got a rush order, we got to push into the system. The API call will come directly to us. We'll be able to see it instantaneously, 
schedule the job, and away we go. That's the big difference. So the API call version, and everyone who has ERP systems here, they have API calls now. If you have the latest versions, whether it's Apple Core, Global Shop, God Boss, E2, it doesn't matter. They all have they all have these RESTful, what they call APIs, which are coupling agents to get this data more instantaneously. Okay. So in our world, continuous improvement starts at the fact that we're connecting directly to the machine in real time. So I want to go through some examples here. Is if we have that information, then we're able to say, okay, what machines are running the jobs the best? Where's our bottlenecks? If you can see how it opens up, I'm not going to read all the slides, but you can see ultimately where's the hidden factory on the shop floor. It's opening up a whole plethora of different avenues to review the data. Okay? So obviously when you have something like this, you want to look at root cause analysis. We're looking at better uptime. And again, all of the houses we've been talking about now start to come visible. By the same token, uh, we can identify bottlenecks. We can look at, in our data, what we want to see is we want to see all the unscheduled events that have some cadence to it. If I see an e-stop alarm in an hour four times on a machine, that's probably a catastrophic failure. There's something probably really going wrong. I need to address that. Our system, that will be visible to you right away. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we, we kind of look at the CI portion of this in terms of performance mod management model. What does that mean? As I said earlier, if you have people, process, or machinery, the change, you have to be able to change with it and understand that the down reasons we're going to track on your shop floor are all configurable. Okay? So if you have configuration, we need to know where they fit in the buckets. The six buckets on the bottom here between machine shop, job, maintenance, and reporting, all these different down reasons fit in different buckets. So it gives you a direction to understand where you need to attack the problems. So a down reason for a job may not be relevant to looking at anything in terms of a maintenance situation. It could be totally unrelated. That's why we made a configurable tool so that the down reasons that each of you want in your shop floor can be totally different on the same piece of equipment because no one looks at the data the exact same way. Okay. So I talked about <clears throat> how we affect Kaizen events. Does anybody here run Kaizen events on their shop floor? Does anybody know what that is first? I guess it's my first question. Maybe you guys do. They want you to just real quick explain kind of what that is just for everybody's sake if you would. Um, basically, the Kaizen are basically when you're going out and resolving issues or enhancing things that you see. So we start out by doing a demo. When we have a demo meeting, we identify those problems, root cause, and then we go out to Kaizen and everybody just formulates his ideas and we go out and we implement those ideas to try to resolve those. Okay. But is it safe to say though, Dave, the first couple steps is collecting data at the machine, right? right? In a manual in a manual way, right? That's okay. Right. So let's think about what Dave just said and what, what I'm relating to you. So that means that Dave is going through, and anybody else is going through basically a seven step process. First two steps is collecting data, right? Understanding what that's saying, formulating a, a solution, implementing that solution, and making that part of standard work if everything goes okay. That's the basic formula. Okay, so what I'm saying is, if you, go ahead. So we're gonna, ship, we're, gonna, we're gonna lower this down by two steps because we're collecting data from machine in real time, right? So now we're cutting the first two steps out. So why do I put up there and say, well, it's a continuous Kaizen? Well, if you have the data already and you're gonna make a move on this, now what I'm saying is let's look at the solution, implement the solution, see if it's part of standard work. We've, we shorten the cycle on that to a large degree because if anybody knows, if you walk on the shop floor and start watching what an operator's doing, they're gonna get a little nervous, they're gonna perform differently than they normally do. And so what we're trying to do is shorten that cycle so that you can get to the root cause analysis and the changes that you want to make on the shop floor and not focus on the data collection. We're already giving that to you. And if Go ahead. I can say one more thing, what you're doing on is something very active. This morning, I'm asking a guy, hey, we had a bad variance in this job a week ago. What was going on? And he's trying to figure out what he was doing. The, the program was trying to figure out what they were doing and, and it wasn't real time. That information would be real time that would be at your fingertips. Exactly. <laughs> so this is this is one of the key take, takeaways is that at some point you're going to use some methodology for continuous improvement on shop floor. So if you have lead managers, you have continuous improvement people on your shop floor, this is what they do all day long. This is what they're looking to get to 
and we're trying to shorten that cycle with real-time data from the machine. I, I know I keep repeating that, but at the end of the day, that is the foundation of everything we're doing. Okay. We might have to go through a little bit. Okay. So again, kind of what Dave just t touched on a little bit, the idea is to touch, get away from the, 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 the talk arounds after the fact type situation. Let's look at the reports. What does the data show us from an hour ago? And we can figure out what we need to do. So I don't, I don't want to belabor a point with that. I think that's understood. But, okay. Um, so I'm going to show you an example. There's a full reporting section, as I mentioned earlier, in our system. You click on the bottom, like there should be a, a start button there for a video. Or click in the click of the square. Um, let me just narrate this because you're not going to be able to hear the, the voice. But I want to show you how you can use real time data reporting system. And this is got a reporting system in our, in, our, in our Tempest. And what you're going to see is one of my colleagues created this. He's just going to look at a very high level view of data and how he's able to drill down in a matter of a couple minutes. So this is a group of machines. And see, he can see on July 5th, if you can read that, there's a big dip in utilization uh, for the day. So now he wants to drill down into a group of machines and understand where the problem potentially is. I should mention everything we're showing here, this is stuff we train people how to do. You can see the CNC mill is down near 15% utilization. It's dragging the entire department down, which would not be visible to you if you didn't have the direct connection. So now what, what Tim's gonna do is he's gonna drill down into that particular machine and see he has 13 hours of maintenance on that particular machine, okay? So now the question we talked about before, is that a one-off event or is that a cadence of series of chronic problems that we need to be aware of? So now he's going to drill down just on that machine, that date, and you can see he's actually got five and a half different events, 13 hours, but now there's a day log that says there's five separate events that occurred that gave you that 13 hours. That means we have a chronic issue. And everything we just showed you in that report, that was all done in less than two minutes. That's how you can go from a very high level view to one machine, one instance that's dragging the entire department down. It's an excellent example of what we do. For, we talked a little bit about earlier about OEE overall equipment effectiveness. There's three KPIs, which Dave talked about KPIs. Availability is machine utilization. Is the machine up or down? If it's down, why is it down? As, as, a, as a percentage of the total shift. So if we're running a shift and we're down for four hours, we got 50% utilization. Quality is good parts versus bad parts. And the performance is you have a certain product that you're, that you're producing that you have a product standard to say, it takes me 10 minutes to produce this part on a regular basis. In our system, you can run the reports six months down the road and say, I've run this part 50 times, and it's 10 minutes cycle time. How am I doing against that 10 minutes over a period of time? If I'm running at nine and a half minutes, well, let's change the product standard to nine and a half and start that whole exercise all over again. There's nothing really, I don't like to use the word sexy, but I guess that's what it is, about what we do. But if you use this data, it is brutally effective. And it's right from the machine. There's no subjectiveness to this. It is what it is, and if you use it properly, it will show you the hidden factor that you are currently not seeing. Okay. So, what drives again? Some of the things we talked about before. Let's 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 take our, our digital transformation. Let's get away from manual data collection, subjectiveness, and get information directly from the machine, which is where we need to start our digital journey from. But so, <clears throat> what we're looking at here is kind of what. We typically see what's the desire. So you can see the buckets on the far left. When I go into shops and I've toured a number of places over the years, most people will say, if I ask them what their OE is, I usually get a number north of 60%. The reality is they're probably about 34 to 35%. Understanding that 85% is world class. That gives you the gap. I will tell you that if, if we come in and talk about those improvements, if you improve just four, five, six, eight, ten percent utilization, that is a huge, huge number. Uh, it probably pays for our system a couple times over. And so moving from 15 to 20 to 30 to 50% is a, is, a, is a game changer for a manufacturing company, no question. So the desire and the goal here is to get on the right side here, get up to that 85%. Um, we have some companies who will run close to that periodically. And think about what we're talking about here in terms of data, that if you are running the left side, and somebody says to you, well, hey, we need to buy more equipment and sell number six because we're at capacity, but you see they're only running 30 to 40%. Somebody like Dave, who's got that type of responsibility, says, sorry, guys, we're not buying it. We need to do better with what we have today, right? 
or our data will show the flip side is that, hey, no, we're actually at 70%. We need to think about buying more equipment. The data is driving these decisions. It's nobody's opinion. Data is showing what's actually going on. Yes? I just want to speak to that for a minute. Um, and I talked on the cultural change that that brings, what you were just speaking about, right? Mm -hmm. When the data is driving the decisions, then culturally this has a major impact on every manufacturer and company. Um, it becomes uh, far less personal and people feel validated. They're thinking, you feel, you feel first to see the operator at the position that uh, it's changed, it's big brother, they're watching me, right? Then okay. And then as they begin to use this data, they begin to say, oh, it's validating what I've been trying to say all along. I know that we had a problem with such and such, but nobody ever listened, or I brought it up one time or two times, and then it, nothing happened. But when everyone is surrounded by the machine data, it really helps with continuity and, and a good company culture as well. So I just wanted to throw that in. Absolutely. So uh, again, there's basically nine operation areas, and we're gonna get into this. I'm gonna show a quick demo here. I'm, I'm watching the clock a little bit, so we need to get the demo here shortly. But there's, there's buckets of areas that we need to look at, whether it's actually what's going out the door, operational costs, and things, all things we're gonna to touch on, that, on the demo. So I just want you to be aware, and also mention that uh, I'm sure Michael put out a copy of this presentation if you're interested. Uh, we'll send you a PDF version of it. Okay, so, Again, the 10 to 50 percent value proposition. Um, that's what our customers tell us, and I can send you. We have a number of case studies. Uh, Memex has within our total base about 250 customers. When I say 250, a company like PCC that's owned by Berkshire Hathaway may have four plants. That's one customer. Okay, uh, we're all throughout North America, obviously predominantly in the U.S. Uh, we do have a presence in Brazil. We do have customers in both Norway and also Spain. Um, I, I will tell you all, which I don't know how we'll take this, but basically we've opted not to sell our software in Asia for probably some of the reasons you probably would suspect. Um, and uh, so the IRR, again, leaving no machine behind, that's really a key consideration. And I'm understanding too that you have extensible tool you can use for years from now. That's all like you know this. I think I could go to the, uh, probably go to the uh, demo here. Does anybody have any questions? Go. So you talked about telling how the paper right for two hours. What happens if a company already has a uh, shelf or data collection amount that they don't keep clocking in on the two hours? Like with a kiosk, like an yeah. ERP yeah. kiosk? Yeah, yeah just for a Okay, so the, well, the problem, my first question is, is that connected directly to the machine? No. That's, that's still manual data collection. The only difference is you're not using a clipboard. I'm not trying to be offensive. So, no, I'm yeah. yeah. so, uh, so, so uh, when you're talking about the shop orders being uploaded to what would you upload them to? So we're done, and I'll show you that. We actually have an HMI at the machine. So the operator, again, associates an operator to a machine to a work order. When, when they collect all that information, they're done. Okay, They're going to hit close out. That's going to push that work order plus all the machine state information that we're collecting. That's all going to ultimately get routed back to the ERP, MRP, Kanban system, whatever it is you're using. Because we want you to be able to, at some point, to say, what's the real cost of these jobs? How can we hone in on the cost better if we know what's really going on in real time? Okay. By the same token, is because it's an extensible product, you may have third-party software that you're using. You know, uh, maybe you have vibration analysis or tooling information that another software is providing that we're not connected to. But we would be able to pull that data through that API call I talked about earlier and be able to pull that data in and show that concurrently. So think of, think of the fact if you had a dashboard here showing the current state of the machine, current work order, all the parts produced, parts to go, time on the job, etc., and then maybe some tooling information in real time right next to it. You have a pretty good comprehensive look at what's going on in that machine right now in real time. Yeah, I think that unlike data piece, and you're gonna demonstrate that here in a few minutes, yes. really is very powerful. When you can put unlike information next to it, then you can begin to see what the cause is, why is something running well, why did it stop, who was there, and it's all literally just in line with each other. It's, it's a highly visual system, and that's where we're gonna So let me, give it, let me give a difference. Because I need to do a bunch of data APIs. I mean, it's like work instructions, design documents, all yeah. that. That can be stored on the HMI. That's not part of the work order per se, but it's available as association to it. Yeah. Okay, let me show you the demo. 
So in the last 20 minutes, I'm going to show you um, some basic dashboards. Again, the premise here is, is twofold, that um, the, the dashboards I'm going to show you, the men menus actually up here, is that the dashboards are web-based. So they're, they're a URL page, so you can share them however you want. There's a library here that you can share them. So anyone seeing any of these tables, you can have six different views of the same thing if that's what you want to see. They're also widget-based. What I mean by that is we created a little tools, which I'll show you here, so you can configure the dashboards the way you want to see it. You don't have to just see it the way I'm showing it. There's different ways to configure it. We'll train you how to actually do that. So let me go to uh, start with this. So this is a what we call machine data grid. So kind of like a souped up spreadsheet, if you will. And again, all data is collected directly in machine in real time. What you have is group of machines, the current state of the machines. And these are not selected by us. These are selected by you. The down regions are configurable. So if you say, I want to see idle. I want to see setup time. I want to see single block. I want to see interrupted. I mean, there's a variety of things we can look at. It's all configurable by machine. So a machine directly next to it can have 16 totally different regions if you want. That's the open architecture of the system. Okay. Shift information, we, we bucket everything by shift. Uh, total uptime for the shift. Total, this is the total time of the shift. Total downtime, which we'll get into in a minute. The uptime, if you have part counts. And then in this case, we're just measuring the, the, the uh, utilization of the machine. So I can go in here and say, well, I don't want to see the machines that are currently in cycle. I squish this list down and, and basically block everything out. It'll recalculate all this. And this radial gauge, which is a widget you'll see on top, will we'll show only the aggregates of what's actually being shown. So if we scrunch this down to the different machines, this will change the values in real time and you'll see exactly what that is. So it's a very basic view, but it tells you a lot of information very quickly. So the question is, I want to see some detail of what some of these machines, why these we have 27 minutes or an hour and 20. Where is this down reason stuff starting to get aggregated? Where can I see that? So what we do is we produce a, an event chart here and you can see on the top, um, we can have the work order or the, or the program. Let's, we all know that the operator selects a program on a particular machine. We can associate that to work order and be able to track data against it. And then what you're seeing in real time, this is an hour long timeline. And every time you change event, we go from in cycle to idle to in cycle to e stop. We're starting to tell a story over the course of an hour, a shift, a day of what's actually going on. So if, we, if we're sitting at our desk or at our phone and we see this, we see, remember we talked earlier about the cadence of unscheduled things. We start to see things like this, and what you're seeing here, I see three situations, and all I gotta do to understand what the detail of the, of the event is, I click on it, and it gives me the operator was away for two minutes from the machine, okay? But I've seen that now three times, actually now four times, in less than an hour. If I'm a manager, I might be starting asking some questions. Why are you away from the machine? So, do you need something? Do you not have a resource? Is there something else you need to have from us to support you? That's the first question I'm gonna ask. But this, this gives you a real, again, this is a historical situation. If you want to go back two weeks on these machines, you can see what that is. And then to Rosa Sharon's point, um, we, she just mentioned on the CNC vote, this TMAC, that is a tooling data. That's not our software. That is a third party data collection that they're pushing into us so we can see. And this event chart is showing events when they change, which means as long as that tool number is number one, this will run number one ad infinitum. But as soon as they change, the operator changes it to machine or to tool number two, we're going to draw a line like you see here, and they'll start number two. So if you read this vertically, you start to see, well, on, on the gap lathe, I was knee stops at 135. Um, that's, that's the actual condition, too. It's this shift. Um, I'm in the pr process of making a part count, but you see the part count is actually elongated because we're doing downtime. So chances are good the standard rate is not being met here because we're actually at down state at that particular moment versus what you see here, which is probably more indicative of what an actual part count is at three minutes. So you can see this starts to tell you a story. And from an engineering standpoint, this is what you want to be able to see because this is managing what's going on on a shop floor through a group of machines. And then this is some of the widgets on the bottom we have set up for you. So the same machines, but now we have it grouped what the different down reasons are and there's two ways to look at this. this. This is set up in minutes. It could be minutes, seconds, or hours. Or we can set up the y-axis here to be number of occurrences. So we could just say, as you saw earlier, 
Well, scheduled maintenance was 86, but we, we can also turn this on to say, well, this was three events. So if you're a manager like Dave and says, well, we're only supposed to have two scheduled maintenance today. What, what happened on the third one? Why do we have a third one? Well, the data shows there was one. He can now go back on the system and start taking that out. Any questions? Okay. So I want to show you, let me flip over. So when we talk about the event chart, you saw a group of machines, but we also have the machine details for that particular machine. So any machine that we have, if you want to get into current shift, current work order information, we can see that. So you can see the operator's Elvis, you can see we're in a scheduled maintenance situation, how long that particular state is now derived. Shift information, again, that total time, uh, part counts, and if the utilization machine's obviously down. And then you could have, as an example, the utilization chart that says, hey, I can see what's happened over X number of hours, days, weeks, and trend this out and see at any point in time what's actually going on in the machine. So this is more of a, a drill down view specifically to one machine. I'm going to take you the other direction. Now we're going to look at a full shop floor view. So if you were to give us preferably a PNG or a JPEG of your shop floor, what you could do is we'll place these widgets directly over the location of the floor. So when you walk in the office in the morning, you turn this on, anything that's not green is not good, whatever it is. And now you have the detail to say, hey, I know where I need to walk on the shop floor, I can see what the problems are. And a lot of people, managers, will use this as kind of their first view of the day, so to speak. Uh, but as I said, these are widgets, there's different templates. So these are very, I'm gonna move this up a little bit so you can read this. We got the gantry mill here. So you can see the real-time utilization, 84% what job's being run, who the operator is, part counts, total time, et cetera. There could be less data on this, or there could even be more data if you want to see that. This is just somebody who wants to see a little more detail. And just so you know, that last screen I showed you where we went into the individual machine detail, if I click on any one of these, this will hyperlink me automatically to the next dashboard where that individual data was at. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to show, because we're running out of time, is if we're running jobs, and this is kind of the important, kind of the roll up of all of our data, Memex, our system Tempest is not a schedule. That's why you don't see the word schedule up here, it's actually a sequencer. Because the ERP system is gonna push down and say, in an ideal world today, this is what we're going to run. Each one of these lines is a machine. So the ERP will say, well, we're gonna run this job first, green is what's on the job, on the machine currently, and everything in red is set up in queue. So the ERP has said, this is what we're gonna to do today if everything goes the way we're supposed to go. However, we're monitoring what's going on in the machine directly. So what happens is that if we start to queue downtime on this SSP job, this whole chart's gonna start sliding to the right, correct? So at some point, our system's gonna know that if that continues long enough, enough downtime, maybe this job over here, which is now 24 hours away from starting, will start to flash red in our system. Because what you're doing now on the shop floor is affecting that either starting on time or shipping on time. So we have a product. So what do we do? So product standards say, most people's product standards say, what's the description of the part? What's the setup time? What's the standard rate? When you ship it, how many parts are required? The other piece that you're missing is, we ask what other machines are capable of running this job for the very reason we're just looking at. Because if we know that this NB job could be run here on this machine, whatever machine this is, we have open capacity there, right? Because you told us in the product standard you could run it on that particular machine. So why not move it over? Because you just got notification that you're late and you don't change anything else, it's going to be late. So you drop and drag this, so your production control people can actually drop and drag that job over to the open capacity and continue to run. So when the ERP system refreshes, they'll see the change. It's about how you, and I don't know if any of you any aerospace work, but when you work with, when you work with Airbus, or Boeing, one of their requirements is their suppliers need to show them how they're going to make on-time deliveries. Where's their portal? Show me that you got your jobs. Our jobs on your shop floor are gonna make on-time deliveries. How are you gonna do that? So they'll use a screen that looks similar to this. At the end of the day, this is what it's all about, right? Getting stuff done, getting out the door on time. And giving you a realized view. 
So your production control people don't have to walk on the floor, go to machine to machine. Are you doing the job where you at? They can look at this and they know exactly what's going on. Okay. I think I'm done. <laughs> I think that's good. Any questions? If you're interested, I know we skimmed the demo a little bit. I'll be happy to do it again. So for you I want you like. and those of Sharon come up. Uh, let's just field some questions. Yeah, sure. Who's got a question? You've got to have a little bit. Of, I mean, it's a lot, right? I think, you know, think of this. I think um, our first experience in putting in KPIs was that we, we took a lot of time to get the KPIs up and, and get them in place. And that was a lot of work, right? Fleet, Fleet COO, he, he put them all together. And now we got this dashboard and you kind of go, all right, well, now we got it. What are we supposed to do with it, right? You start looking at all this data. Um, having the information if that if all you do is look at it, it doesn't do you any good right it's it's really about using that information to gain better utilization better quality better product productivity and use of those very expensive assets right some of these machines we have a client that each machine costs well over a million dollars if you can juice 10 percent more out of that machine that's excellent you start running out of capacity, right, Elizabeth? You start running out of capacity, and you start saying, oh, geez, we're running out of physical space. I can't really even fit another machine in here. What do I do? You know, and you start looking at extra shifts. Extra shifts are expensive. Maybe you're already full. And you start thinking about weekends. These are ways of you, instead of just doing those very expensive moves, but if you can increase efficiency by 10 or 20% out of that machinery, then all of a sudden, you have a tremendous amount of capacity that, by the way, doesn't really cost you anything. So it's why when Frank talks about the return on these investments, you can have potential for huge returns on the investment that you're getting from Frank because it's really about utilizing those assets in a more productive manner. But it's really important that you think through that process because it, having the data alone is not enough. Getting the data is a lot of work, but now what do you do with it when you finally have it? Questions, thoughts? Um, so some of the places I see the resistance is people think, well, I'm not full. I'm not running at full capacity right now. I'm just a job shop. I have short runs. Um, I do prototype work. So that's one of the places where I see the, 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 the pushback. They think, they think of it as pushback. But what I think those, um, those manufacturers are missing is that even if most of your time is spent in setup, for example, that is still a valuable metric of machine usage. So this is not just for the production house where you're running out full volume all the time. Um, this also works in a job shop environment. And um, the other thing that I hear is I already know what's going on on my shop floor, <laughs> right? Um, and that one's pretty laughable because what people find is they don't know what's going on on the shop floor. You heard Frank mention the word hidden factory several times in the presentation. That's the terminology that we use. Um, but truly, there are a lot of misconceptions, and, and the examples are just kind of funny. Um, I, I work with ERP pretty extensively and understand the power of logging in when you start and your job and all of that kind of thing. But I work for a company that different operators had different perceptions of at what point in the morning do you uh, log into a machine. And um, we didn't catch it for long periods of time. We had. Uh, other situations were break time. Some operators would clock out, some of them wouldn't. People had different perceptions of things, and you just don't catch these things uh, easily um, until you have the real machine data. So, and Frank, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think the, the couple things I would add to that is that, and this is going to sound a little, I don't want to say arrogant, but because people know what this is about, I mean, people. Everyone in this room has heard we talk about IoT and data-driven manufacturing. I mean, everybody's heard at least something about it. 
I mean, we don't evangelize about this anymore. We have people come to trade shows and say, I've heard about, you know, raise somebody I work with. I mean, they'll say, people will say, I've heard about this. How does this affect my business? So it's not usually, no, I don't want to do this. It might be, no, I don't have the budget for it now, or we'll look at it next year. But we yes. have a lot of people that come back to us over a period of time just because I think they understand they want to do this at some point. And that doesn't mean I'm not talking about ourselves. I'm just saying in general, they can buy it from our competitors. But I think most people understand that this is where our business is headed one way or another. And the question is, understand that there's only about 5% of the machine tools in the world that are connected. So even if you work with us or somebody else down the road, you're still an early adapter. This is still this is still an industry situation. It's not well. It's not well mature by any stretch. And so let me a quick example because I, I you know Mike's always telling me hey make sure you lead an example. So we have a customer in Wisconsin. I'll give you a good good example how somebody uses our data. What they do is they run an operator utilization report. So they have all these stamping presses, about 25 of them. And Dave runs days, I run afternoons, the roses is, is the night shift. Same jobs, same press. The only difference is we're three different people run those jobs, right? So the question they look at is says, well, we need to know who needs the training. So every week they run this report, and lo and behold, I'm the low guy in the totem pole. I'm running the less, I'm running the least amount. So over the course of last year, I get some training because obviously if these two people are doing something I'm not doing, which I need to know what that is. Working. We're working. working. Right. <laughs> That's right. So what's happened is, as you'd expect, as I said earlier, no big jumps, but we're all just kind of going like this over the course of time. And what they're doing is they want to be able to cross-train people across to run any press on the shop floor. So they now have 12% documented utilization improvement in the operator reports that they run. Now, 25 presses and 12%, that's a pretty big number. It's just, it's just an increment. There's nothing fancy about it, but they're just they, they're looking at the data and saying, between the human capital, where's the problem? The machines are the same, the work orders are the same, it's gotta be something that we're doing different. It's a good example of how our data is used. Yeah, Mike, uh, maybe for, your, uh, for our audience, guide us a little bit from a total market strategy, and not talk about financials, but from a timeline standpoint, explain to us a typical engagement with the, uh, of our audience here, how it will work, how okay. it should work as well. So, there's basically a five-step deployment process. So let's assume we all agree to work together. And what happens is the first thing is we need to understand if you can provide us a dedicated SQL database inside your shop. We do have a cloud option, as I said earlier, but most of our customers are on-prem. That means that the server is inside your building. So we set that up first. That's the first point. Uh, wherever the hardware board is, depending on how many hardware boards you need in a deployment, our next step is we send a guy out to your shop floor to install those hardware boards and the legacy equipment. The next thing we do remotely is stage three is to connect the machine data. So if you have 16 different down reasons you want to look at a machine, we have to validate all those remotely. So we need to look in through the server. Somebody's on the shop floor saying, yeah, put the machine in e-stop, put it in e-stop. I can see it and we validate each signal. It's a little tedious, but once that's done, all the data is accurate. The last portion is we do the training. We'll go through how to create these dashboards how to use the reports, all the things I just talked about. That's all part of the training package. And then the last step is the ERP, if you guys decide at some point to connect to it. Most of our customers do not start out with that. They get to it eventually, but they don't start out with that. So to answer um, Philippe, your question, to do all that, that stuff, depending on how big the shop is and how many boards we need to connect, um, on a short timeline, that can be done probably in 60 plus days. Long time, it might take up to four or five months because it's a timing issue. When can we get on your shop floor to put the boards in? Because we have to interrupt production to do that. So that's that's usually the bottom line. But to deploy this in less than six months on a large scale is certainly doable. We've done it a number of times. And I have one other question. Um, so our, our floor, our manufacturing operation, we have a really complicated, really high value products that we manufacture. Um, and it's a combination of some automated equipment, a lot of manual operations, and automated inspection. And is there a way that you work to sort of get that manual like times and things like that that you can look at some of that information? Yeah, I ran out of time, but there's actually an HMI that I was gonna pull up to show you. Okay. Um, so what that HMI does is, as we all know, the machines don't tell us everything. So the people have to tell us some of that. So the assembly lines we have today is we have the, this operator portal maybe stationed per line or per 
the top 10 out of 20, I'm just using general terms here. But if you're able to do that, then you can, the operator can select and say, okay, I'm logged into a job, it's out 10. When I'm done, I'm gonna pass the work to you. So now it's over to out 20, okay? But if you incur some kind of maintenance or an idle time, you can make those selections. The only difference here is we're just taking the human capital and placing the machine and saying, we're tracking that as a way to understand. Push button, I hate you. Right, because that's connected back to the network and say, yep, I, when we're done at op 40, whoever's op 40, we finish the part, we roll that up, it looks just like what I just showed you. Yeah, okay. just, just came from the other, the other thing too is that there's a timeline to that job. So right. even, even if they're messing around, not being diligent on pushing the button, you still know at the time it started with them and at the time it ended with them. Right. No matter what happened there, if that's out of standard, you're gonna have some visibility. Right. So let's say instead of a work order, maybe my, my experience is maybe it's a playbook or attack time you're looking at. You're saying, hey, there's 70 minutes to produce this on four stations. How are we doing? So the dashboard can say, okay, I started out 10, but now we're decrementing the time down, right? To, all the way to zero, it never stops. But meanwhile, we're looking at the utilization for each station concurrently and the park counts and the down reasons. So it's giving you a pretty good broad base of what's actually going on throughout that process. It's no different if you've ever been to an engine plant, how they produce engines, it's the same concept. Up 10, up 20, up 30, 40. If something goes down, if you're collecting manual data, well, where's, where are we down at? We got eight stations here, I have no idea. But our dashboard just say, hey, we got a problem at 40. You could walk right out to 40 and say, hey, what's the issue, why are you guys idle? Are you missing materials, raw materials, whatever? Yeah, and I would just add to that, he didn't have a chance to show the HMI or the human machine interface, that particular screen, essentially. But it's a very highly configurable interface for the operator, and you're able to roll it out the way that you train the operator. So you bring in little pieces at a time. First, you're just showing them information, then you're giving them a chance to input a little bit of information, and then you can build on that and you train the operator as you're changing, uh, again, uh, that, that uh, cultural environment at your shop. You're building that around that operator portal, essentially. So, and that's a part, it's, it's a very nice way just to step your team into where, where this all goes. Yeah, so it's a, when you talk about leaving nothing behind, I mean, think about, you know, we have customers with a lot of people who machine parts, they stand parts, whatever, but, well, by the way, over in the corner is our powder coat line. Well, that's the last thing all these parts see before it goes out the door. We better track that because if that's not running, everything else just gets backed up. So in your, your, in your situation, which I suspect is the assembly is probably pretty critical. It may be a, may, could potentially be a bottleneck, Maybe that's what you need to track because all this other stuff is flowing into it. Yeah. Yeah. Do um, when would be critical times to really, you know, any time is a good time to look at this in improving efficiencies. But but uh, what are the critical kind of decision points when you should say, wait a minute, maybe we should consider, uh, you know, looking at our operational performance rather than what. I would generally say, kind of back to what I thought before, is that if there's an inclination that you're gonna buy more equipment, and Dave will tell you, Ray will tell you, I mean, no exaggeration, some of these pieces of equipment can run millions of dollars. So it's a big investment. And one of my colleagues likes to say our cost of our software is a rounding error to that, but it's pretty true. So I would say if you're looking to buy new equipment, doing the expansion, are you in growth mode to the point you've gotta find extra capacity without so Buying shift work, decisions. Yep, shift decisions, adding extra shifts, uh, new equipment. You know, when, when, the, when the paradigm is changing, that's a good time to look at that. Also, when lead times become critical, when you're missing on time deliveries, those are also times when you definitely want to start considering this. I think this is really a future of manufacturing in, the re in this way. Future manufacturing is going to require everyone to be faster, right? We've got to be more flexible, be able to do smaller job quantities, and we've got to be able to get it out the door faster than ever before. It's that highly customizable environment now that we're looking at making things. And, and, and this kind of real-time information is going to be vital in the future for companies to be able to make smaller batches, quite frankly, and to make it faster than ever before. Um, because you've got to know minute by minute you can't afford to waste the time anymore to get things to market. I mean, hey, Amazon's doing same-day delivery. What is that going to do to manufacturing? Okay. Any, any other questions? Um, thank you for coming. Uh, thanks to Memex. Nice to have you. Uh,
it, if you uh, care for the presentation, if you want a copy of it, uh, just let uh, one of the mother chief folks know or Memex, and we'll uh, we'll get your business card and email you a copy. Uh, any other questions, you can reach out to us or to Memex uh, and take it from there. But uh, other than that, make sure you, you have a cookie. And thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.